Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming to uh, tonight's uh, uh, orthopaedic specialist uh, update on pediatric elbow conditions. Um, as you know, uh, orthopaedic specialists, we uh, run regular webinars um, on education regarding musculoskeletal conditions. And today, we're lucky enough to have um, Professor Roger Van Reet, together with uh, Mr. Jagwan Singh and uh, Mr. Ali Nurani um, today. Uh, we've also got Mr. Tom Crompton, who hopefully will be joining us a little bit later Sadly, he's been called away for an emergency. Um, as you know, all of these things are, can be quite unpredictable, but he's currently fixing um, bilateral hips, he's telling me, um, in Brighton. So, so he's currently um, taken away, but hopefully he'll be with us a bit later on. Um, I'm your host for this evening. My name is Ragbir Singh Kaka. Um, I'm sure I know a lot of you. Uh, we've all virtually met before, and I host the educational um, element for orthopedic specialists. So... I'm, I'm one of many clinicians, um, which is, we're expanding all the time. And we're lucky enough to have this, this group of um, clinicians ranging from um, all aspects of orthopedic conditions, upper limb, lower limb, head, neck, maxillofacial, uh, foot and ankle, through to pain specialists, rheumatologists. And we'd like to pride ourselves on the fact that all of our a team is made up of high-end orthopedic surgeons, um, um, maxillofacial surgeons, and uh, plastic surgeons. So this is a, a, a fantastic group of people and I'm happy to be part of this team. We also have surgeons from around the world joining us who are at the top of their game. And so we like to think we're very unique, um, particularly um, in the UK with the makeup of specialists that we have. And we hope we're able to offer uh, solutions to most um, musculoskeletal conditions. So this is our day case facility, Harley Street Specialist Hospital. Some of you may have come across this before. It's a beautiful triple fronted uh, building on Queen Anne Street, which we've had the um, luxury of refitting recently. Uh, so we've got fantastic new theatres on the ground floor, uh, day case hospital, where we've also got the ability to keep in patient um, overnight if required. We're now building a second theatre in the basement and that project will be complete uh, in the autumn of this year. And we've recently refurbished the first floor uh, to open up um, outpatients and uh, dental, um, a dental suite also. So really exciting times. And um, we've got a fantastic x-ray uh, suite to open also. So um, if you ever want to come and see um, any of our clinicians or simply want to come and sit in for, an edu for educational purposes, uh, this can be arranged, and usually we do this out of Harley Street Specialist Hospital. We are partnered up with the London Clinic, um, and many thanks for their support, as always, for, uh, for these educational events. Uh, the London Clinic is a fantastic um, a, a private facility, but it's one of the biggest private hospitals in London. And this is where we do our major cases. Uh, patients who stay in more than one night are typically um, operated on here. Uh, they're great partners with us. I'm pleased to introduce the Cromwell Hospital also. Um, this is where we've opened up our paediatric service. And um, I'll just get a touch upon the service that we're doing with them, um, particularly offering urgent uh, care for, for paediatric patients who have had um, injuries. So I'll touch on that a bit later on. So Mr. Ali Nurani, he's, he's our, one of our co-founders. Um, he's a good friend of mine and I work very closely with him requires no introduction. Um, he's an um, incredibly uh, talented surgeon specializing in all aspects in upper limb surgery. And um, he has a practice based out of the Royal London, as well as the um, Harley Street Specialist Hospital. And he's one of our co-founders. Rog, Rog, Professor Van Reet, uh, Roger to his friends and colleagues, is, um, has been part of the team and he's already done uh, some outpatients with us and done some lifts with us. And these have been um, fantastically received uh, by uh, local physios, GPs and patients. He truly is a pioneer in the uh, world of arthroscopy and we're, we're very lucky to have him. He looks after sportsmen and women from around the world, including Olympic and world um, athletes. And more importantly, all the work that he does is backed up with uh, papers that he's um, he's he's been uh, co-authors authors on and uh, published very widely. So he's going to be uh, doing uh, most of the speaking today, and um, like I said, we're very lucky to have him. 
Mr. Jagwan Singh, um, once again, a he's a fellow orthopedic surgeon who I, uh, who I, who's a contemporary of mine. Um, he's widely trained around the world and he boasts fellowships at the Stedman Clinic, uh, Harvard Shoulder Unit, the Mayo Clinic, and he's been awarded um, for, for the work that he's been done. So one, he's based out of Lewisham for his um, NHS commitments and he's part of our team. So he'll be, he'll be co-hosting the uh, webinar with me today. And finally, Mr. Tom Crompton, he's a consultant, consultant surgeon based out of Brighton at the Royal Alexander Hospital. Um, he's an expert in all aspects of pediatric orthopedic surgery. And so he manages limb deformity, uh, acute trauma, uh, deals with cerebral palsy, neuromuscular conditions. And so he's, he's got a um, very wide practice um, when it comes to, comes to children. And he um, heads up as part, as part of the pediatric service at OS. So the topics we're going to talk about today are covered by Roger include paediatric elbow deformity and osteochondritis disaccounts of the elbow. Um, Tom, as I said, is uh, currently doing a trauma case as we speak, and we really hope he's going to come and join us to talk, about, uh, talk to us about acute elbow uh, trauma. Um, my name is Ragbir Kaka. I'm also one of the co-founders um, for OS and HSH. Um, I'm a knee surgeon um, based out of Guys and St. Thomas's. Um, and um, I'll, I, I look after the educational side of things for OS. So by way of update, um, for all of you tuning in today, we, we are running, we're launching a on-call service for sports injuries, predominantly for pediatrics, but also for adults um, if required. Um, this is gonna be a service that we offer um, as, as a triage to any patient who suffers an injury, particularly over the weekend with lockdown now, um, no longer uh, in force. Um, there, are, there, there are going to be the, um, patients who you may want us to have a look at, um, and whether that's upper limb, lower limb injuries, uh, we can triage these for you. Um, th this service starts this weekend, and I have the luxury of being the first one on call. So my number's at the bottom of the screen. So if you have a patient who has sustained an injury that requires attention, We'll take a history, get an idea of what's going on. And um, if required, we can see them at the Cromwell Hospital over the weekend, uh, immobilize the appropriate limb and organize the imaging. We will then make sure that they go into the limb specific surgeons clinic within that same week. So if you have such a patient or know somebody who needs some help, do not hesitate to get in touch. And please feel free to call me on this number. Finally, um, before I hand over to Roger, um, we're going to be uh, sending out emails for the next uh, webinar. Uh, for this webinar, you'll be um, awarded two CPD points after you've answered the questionnaire. Uh, we all have our social media platforms, um, so please do follow us uh, for updates as to what we're up to. And if you want to ever, if you ever want to contact us, um, the general number is there, um, and as well as if it's an upper limb specific inquiry. Uh, please call us on the second number. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the team um, for, uh, um, for, for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Rags. Um, I think without wasting any time, but before we start, we just let you know, um, if you have any questions, um, just put it up in the Q&A box and we'll answer it as we go along. Um, and I'll hand over to Professor Van Reet for um, his talk on updates on pediatric deformity and osteochondritis desiccans. Thanks guys, I'll uh, share my screen with you. There we go. So I thought I'd take it a step further and uh, talk about 3D planning of pediatric uh, elbow deformities. I do have a disclosure, I'm a designer of this uh, elbow brace and I'm a designer with uh, Acunet uh, as well. Um, indications for 3D planning include non-union, malunion and possibly dislocations. Symptoms, patients will present with symptoms like pain, instability, stiffness, but mainly aesthetics. Um, this little patient had a, um, a rotation deficit, so that was clearly, uh, clearly uh, uh, stiffness, but uh, main, main indication is probably aesthetics, patients and parents are concerned about the way the elbow looks or the way the forearm looks. And we think that um, by um, 
decreasing, for example, varicose angula varicose angulation, we think that we might uh, decrease the chances of uh, degeneration later on in life. There's some disadvantage of 3D modeling. It's expensive. You need an infrastructure. Um, and if you don't have an infrastructure, you need expertise. Even if you have an infrastructure, you need expertise. And I think most of us will uh, need to use a commercial company to do this for us. And despite the fact that it helps during surgery, it's actually quite time consuming. So you really have to sit down with the engineer, uh, look at the, uh, at the pathology, uh, figure out sometimes it's a little bit of a detective work, figure out where the pathology is and where the mal malformation is or the malunited fracture is. Um, this was uh, uh, something that we did a, a few years ago with augmented reality. And I think this might become a part of the future. At the moment, it's not because it's still a, uh, a rigid image, so a static image. And uh, while we're working on, for example, this, in this case, uh, some loose bodies and osteophytes, um, you can't see yourself working on the image yet, but uh, I'm 100% sure that will happen in the, in the future. So at the moment, it's a nice toy. You can actually see the CT scan. Uh, you, can, you can project it anywhere in the room, anywhere you want in, uh, in thin air, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll appear. And uh, then you can do your work um, while you're looking through these glasses. So there are clear advantages of 3D. Uh, I don't think anyone will doubt the advantage of 3D imaging. Uh, we've gone from, uh, from x-rays to, to CT scans and in the CT scan, I tend to sort of create a 3D image in my mind, uh, but now the computer can do that for us. Although we lose a little bit of the, um, uh, we lose some details, but um, still this is very helpful to explain to us what the pathology is and to explain, for example, to the patient or the parents to see what's going on. A step further is planning. Um, like I said, it'll, uh, it'll help you during the OR, so it decreased OR time for sure, although that time you're probably putting into the case before you do it. Uh, decreased fluoroscopy. If you do it properly, you don't need um, any fluoroscopy, so no radiation for the patient nor for you, um, and hopefully you'll get improved results, and uh, future research will have to show that. But what it definitely does, it provides insight into the pathology, where we used to think that this was a 2D problem. We now know it's a 3D problem and even maybe a 4D with rotation included as well. Printing is uh, something that can be done quite easily. We are now able in Antwerp, we're able to, uh, to print in, uh, in our hospital. And uh, this was a 14 year old girl with a uh, malunited capitella shear fracture sent to me by the physio. So the physios are extremely important in uh, cases like these. Um, it was missed on the ER, it was missed by the first orthopedic surgeon, unfortunately, because uh, it's quite easily missed. And um, the, the physio found that the stiffness was not caused by muscular uh, problems or not caused by scar tissue, but he felt that this was a heart and feel and, and a heart problem. And then we, uh, we got a CT scan, which obviously showed the, the pathology, but then we were able to, uh, to print this and uh, show to the parents and it helped me to decide where to do the osteotomy. Because obviously in a case like this, you have to be careful not to uh, induce avascular necrosis. And if you uh, get it wrong the first time and you want to you want to correct yourself during the case you might end up with a, a lot of problems besides printing the pathology you can also print guides so uh, you saw earlier that we use the guides on the 3d templating in the, on the computer but you can uh, you can print these for real life with uh, um, basically a guide where to drill a guide where to uh, where to saw and a guide where to do your osteotomy and, re and your reconstruction and then uh, this is not uh, being used a lot in orthopedics yet, but it'll come. It's uh, 3D uh, printing of implants where you can have metal printers and you can easily um, uh, print your implant. You can even um, attach polyethylene if you need to for the articulation. And this has been done now by our maxillofacial uh, uh, colleagues quite a lot. And um, we're, we're actually doing a project now where we're probably going to print a total elbow prosthesis or at least a, a radio capital prosthesis pretty soon. And let's go to the to the practice. You know, it's, it's nice to talk about the theory, but uh, I'll show you a few cases to see what we can do with uh, with these three D this three D technology. This was a ten year old girl, a varus malunited supracondylar fracture. Um, she had a pinning of that fracture three years before, and unfortunately, you know, most of us will dread these fractures coming in in the uh, in the ER, especially if you're not an elbow surgeon and and uh, you're on call and you need to take care of these patients. Um, uh, I'm sure the surgeon did his best, but unfortunately. It ended up with a uh, with the varus malunited uh, fracture, and, and this patient did not have pain. Patient had full range of motion, 
but obviously was concerned about the aesthetics and uh, rightly so, I think. And this is what's done. So uh, and there's a Belgian company called Materialize who, uh, who does this for us. We, uh, like I said, we now have the opportunity to do this in the hospital ourselves. But um, <clears throat> basically together with the engineer, um, you sit down and you say, okay, the osteotomy has to be here uh, as low as possible, obviously, to uh, reduce the chances of non-union. Um, plates in pediatrics is always a bit tricky, so you can use pins if you want, but um, I think a plate is a bit more, uh, uh, a bit stronger, a bit, a bit more stable. Um, stay away from the growth plate, of course, so the plates will look a little bit funky, and then you reverse engineer. So as you saw, you do the reduction, you do the, you do the osteotomy, and then basically pull it back to where it is now in the patient, and then the holes in your uh, in your humerus will be uh, will be completely off, will not fit the plate. But if you do your osteotomy perfect, then basically you've already drilled your holes, and you simply put the plate on and you're done. Um, they supply a 3D PDF that you can play around with, and uh, you can uh, again look at all the steps before you sign off on uh, <clears throat> on the on the final product. And then when you're happy to uh, to go ahead. This is during surgery. You see again. You see there's a, a huge varus malalignment. When you're happy to go ahead, they'll print uh, pre osteotomy, post osteotomy humerus for you. Even that little wedge that you saw is being printed. And uh, we have a cutting guide, a drill guide, and a fixation guide. This is very important. It looks a little bit like we're playing around, but uh, this is very important because what you do is you make sure that the guide fits on only one spot. Because if it doesn't fit, or if you put it on wrong obviously you're off and uh, you don't want to have that. So you need to be uh, perfect, fine, together with the engineer, find a bony landmark that you're able to reproduce. And they will make sure that it sort of clicks on top of the, of, in this case, the plastic humerus, but that will be the same in the patient uh, herself. So it clicks on top of it, make sure that you're in a perfect position. If you're not sure, you can use fluoroscopy and have a look. But uh, usually if you get a nice bony landmark, you're able to, uh, to do this. And this is what it looks like post-op. Um, it usually heals without problems in these young kids. Uh, we use uh, quite narrow plates. And as you can see, I bent the plate a little bit to uh, accommodate the humerus a bit better, but um, the x-ray looks nearly the same as the, as the planning. And this girl is very happy. And, and I told you before that this is a 3D problem. It's not just varus valgus, it's not just flexion extension, but it's also a rotational problem, as you can see on the, on the pre-op picture. And um, even that rotation will be uh, addressed with your 3D planning and 3D osteotomy. More or less the same, 14 year old boy, lateral condyle fractured, seven years old, was treated conservatively. Um, there is a little risk in patients like these that it won't heal, but in this patient it did heal and uh, the surgeon was uh, pretty sure it would, uh, it would remodel and it did remodel to a certain extent, but unfortunately not enough and he ended up with a uh, varus malalignment again. So um, actually quite a big wedge that we needed to remove, so 9.3 millimeters, so almost a centimeter of, of wedge needed to be removed in order to get the proper position. And um, as you can see on this image, uh, because the patient has grown over the years, seven years ago, the, the, he had a fracture, it's grown. So now when you do the osteotomy, it doesn't really fit anymore. There's a, there's a, sometimes you need to translate the, the joint a little bit. See, so this doesn't really fit, um, but, because we use the, the non-injured side, we know that the position will be perfect, despite the fact there is a little bit of translation, but obviously we take care of that by just trimming the edges. When you're doing this, uh, make sure that you take care of the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve should not be in the way, as you can see, um, the osteotomy in this uh, patient was on the, on the radial side, or at least the, the first uh, drilling was on the radial side. Um, and make sure that the, that the nerve is not in the way. Secondly, the triceps is in the way. So as you can see with the earlier case, the 10-year-old girl, we had a big slot to, uh, to do the osteotomy, but we've gone smaller and smaller and smaller because the triceps is in the way. And obviously the more dissection you need to do to accommodate your, uh, your guides, uh, the more you're disturbing this, uh, the anatomy of the patient. Um, again, you can see on this one, uh, the reversed uh, engineering, you see that these uh, drill holes do not line up, but they will line up after the osteotomy. Cutting guide little bit big, uh, like I said, and these are the pre and post op, uh, uh, sorry, post osteotomy uh, um, uh, templates. This is his elbow, so uh, more or less the same as the girl, uh, very big uh, varus malalignment. There's our guides, 
drill guide, osteotomy, wedge, plate, even plate was printed. Um, sometimes it's a bit difficult to get the STL files from the uh, companies because they don't really want to give the, give away their uh, their secrets. Uh, because if you give this to, obviously, if you give your STL files to Materialize, it's very easy for Materialize to print this. And uh, and uh, why would we buy it again? This patient, we only used one plate. We got a nice fixation. And uh, again, it healed without any problems. 15-year-old boy, again, similar. Had two fractures, which made it, made it a little bit more difficult. But that's not really difficult for our, uh, for our engineers. Exactly the same. Two plates in this in this patient. It was a bit a uh, bit of a bigger uh, bigger lad, as you can see. Uh, we left quite a big gap, but again, that gap sort of heals. These young patients do not have problems healing. Um, they have problems with their uh, with their uh, uh, angulation. And this is him, and it's hard to tell which which side was operated. This again, these patients are usually not operated for pain, not operated for stiffness. They're operated because of the aesthetics, and they hate it. And um, hopefully, in my surgeon's heart, we'll be able to avoid degenerative changes later on for these, uh, for these young people. This is a, uh, an adult, obviously, but had a fracture uh, earlier, as um, I think six or seven years ago again. As you can see, he's, uh, he was still growing when he had his fracture, so one side is longer than the other one. We, um, our engineer is able to, uh, to correct for that. And uh, this is one, it's a case we did a couple of weeks ago. So we now have smaller and smaller guides, uh, as long as basically you have the, the, the correct direction. Um, it's printed, we get them in the, uh, in the OR. Here you can see the various metal alignment again, which is quite severe. This guy was actually painful. So uh, uh, maybe if you have them, uh, if you have them young, um, they won't have pain at the elbow, but this, uh, <clears throat> uh, this young man had, uh, was 20 years old now and he started to get painful. Reasonably big approach uh, where you can get away maybe with a smaller approach if you do a 2D and, uh, and, and basically if you, if you feel that you do not need to uh, have a perfect reduction but you get a better reduction, you could probably get away with a, smaller, uh, with a smaller incision. But in this case, you need a reasonably big approach because the, the, the guides need to fit perfectly. And that's why, uh, as you can see, I, I skeletalized the, uh, the distal humerus. It's completely loose. Here's my pre-osteotomy template. And again, it's, it's stuck. It's stuck on that, on that spot. At this point, I'm obviously afraid of dropping this thing. So I'm, I'm holding on with, uh, uh, for dear life and then fix it, make sure it's stuck. So in this case, we moved it down and then fix it with a couple of pins and then uh, uh, the osteotomy is easy and you can do this with a lot of confidence so I, I don't even think twice i just make sure that the guide is in the right spot that's extremely important but as soon as i'm happy that the guide is in the right spot i'm happy to go ahead with my osteotomy so we removed quite a big uh, quite a big piece of bone in this uh, in this patient and then the second one is my reduction so this fits perfectly over the pins and now i know okay it's reduced it's fine Putting the plates on is the same as uh, in any other fracture or osteotomy, and this is the end result. And that's something that patients like. They obviously will have pain after surgery, but they really enjoy uh, the immediate aesthetic results. So uh, immediately when they wake up, the first thing they do is, is look, at their, uh, look at their arm and see how straight it goes. And that's sort of also a motivation to, uh, to move the arm. So in conclusion, 3D modeling for elbow sequelae, elbow trauma sequelae. There are definitely advantages. I think the advantages uh, is getting an insight into pathology. It, it, uh, using this for a few years now, it has definitely made me a better, a better surgeon. I understand pathology much better than I did before when we're just sampling on x-rays. Um, this advantage is, is the, time, uh, the time it consumes. It's really, you need, to, you need to put quite a few hours in before you actually understand it. But, Let's call it an investment and, and a teaching opportunity for yourself. Um, the price, it's expensive. It's uh, uh, usually not reimbursed by most insurance companies. Um, but, uh, you know, I can, I can tell my patients with a lot of confidence that if this was my kid, I would definitely have um, pay the extra cost and, and go for the 3D uh, modeling. It is a developing technique. Uh, printable implants will surely uh, uh, come to our uh, come to our hospitals, maybe even with the printer in the hospital itself, 
an augmented reality once it becomes live. So once it, it's no longer a, um, a static, um, a static uh, technique, it'll it'll gain momentum. I think. Thank you. I'm wondering if you want to do questions now, or do you want to con just continue with the OCD talk, uh, Jack? Some um, questions now, right? There was one question that came up was. Uh, uh, to say how good a CT scan is in a pediatric joint uh, where ossification is yet to happen for 3D printing. Um, yeah. So uh, do you want to take that question? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And, uh, and we know that we have younger patients. Um, it's sometimes difficult to read CT scans or x-rays. However, uh, because you're planning on both sides, so you need, uh, when you look at the CT scans, you need quite, uh, quite detailed CT scans. You need to be able to. You need to make sure that you scan high enough on the humerus and low enough on the forearm, because if you want to, if you want to calculate the angles, you need. You know, the more the more moment arm you have, the more uh, uh, you have, the better, the easier it is. And then it doesn't really matter because you have you, you're not drilling into the um, uh, into the cartilage or the, into the um, into the growth cartilage. Basically, you're using your osteotomy in the bone that the patient already has. Where you're doing a distal humerus osteotomy and that bone is already there. So if there's an angle uh, that's, um, that needs to be corrected, make sure that you have enough forearm and enough humerus. And that way you can also always correct it without even uh, looking at the joint almost. So that's, uh, that's possible. The one thing is, and that's an important point, um, try not to, uh, to have more than three months between the CT scan and the actual surgery. So uh, as soon as you get the CT scan, tell the patients, uh, tell the parents, Listen, as soon as we, we have the CT scan, the, the process starts because we can't waste a lot of time. It takes, it takes some time for the engineers to, uh, to process it and it takes time for us um, to, uh, to sit down with the engineer and, uh, and make an appointment and take half an hour or an hour to uh, discuss this case. So uh, then it needs to be printed, which is, it becomes faster and faster, but, uh, but still, you know, six weeks is probably, probably the minimum. Sorry, that was my dogs in the background. I'm gonna kill them after this. <laughs> so uh, I was saying, so three months, um, uh, try to do it as fast as possible and tell the parents, listen, sometimes parents say, oh, I don't want my kid to be operated upon uh, just before the exams or uh, we're going skiing in January. So can it wait till February? That's all fine. You can plan it. It's not gonna, it's not gonna make a huge difference in your, uh, in your osteotomy. And once you've decided that when the CT scan, when you get the CT scan, it starts. And then, um, then you need to have a solid uh, timing. This is when we do the CT, this is when we do the surgery, and we need to be, uh, the whole team needs to be ready by then. I presume the main concern here is that the children keep on growing, yes. hence the CT may be out of date. Um, with some of the adults, I presume, if this was, I mean, I've used this for adults for 3D planning. Um, and we like to again get it done within a few months, um, but sometimes if we get delayed and so on in adults, it makes very little difference. Yeah, it um, doesn't matter that much. It's it's mainly in kids because they grow and then, and then the guys simply don't fit anymore. Yes, right. We told us this is six months is the time where the jigs and the PSI should last for, so it should be done within six months of operating. There's yeah. a question, uh, Roger. The, the shoulders, Jack, the, um, when you're doing arthroplasty, completely different uh, thing because the glenoid can continue wearing out. So any, any place, I guess, where the deformity is changing due to attrition or growth, we need to get on with it. Yeah. There is another question, Roger. How long after surgery do you remove the pinning? Oh, that depends on the healing and depends whether, they, uh, whether it's bothering them or not. Um, um, I've done it as soon as, as three months post. These are these are little kids. Some of them are little kids, and uh, you know you can see the plates almost through the skin. And then uh, as soon as it's healed enough, I'll remove it. So I've done it as early as three months post, even in distal humerus. Great. I'm a little bit less. Uh, I'm a little bit more concerned with uh, forearm. Uh, three months is quite early to remove it because the forearm sort of takes a long time to heal first of all, and then it takes some time to remodel and, and strengthen. So so I uh, with the with the humerus I don't. I, I'm not that worried. I'll take it out as soon as it's uh, it's okay in the X-ray. With the forearm, I'll try to tell the parents and the patients to leave it in maybe a little bit longer. 
it's, a, it's a forearm where, where you have two bones where the where the the three-dimensional aspects of the deformity becomes even more apparent. Uh, mm-hmm. Having done quite a few more forearms, done a few supracondylars, but forearms, especially in adults, done quite a few with 3D planning and so on. And I think it's very, very useful because uh, and even an angular deformity results in a rotational instability, either at the druge or at the elbow, uh, with the radial head popping in and out. So to get it almost perfect, you just got to get the osteotomy perfectly right in the three dimensions. Oh, it's amazing. Sometimes you look at an X-ray and you think, okay, that doesn't look something. Something is off. You know, you see your angle. That's quite easy in the in the radius or in the, or in the ulna, and you think something is off. And we've had. Uh, um, rotational uh, deformities of more than 50 degrees where, where you don't really pick it up. And you, you, on the x-ray, you, you sort of feel there's something wrong. On a CT scan, you feel there's something wrong. But then when you put them next to each other, there's a 50 degrees um, angle and that's, that's huge. That's, uh, and, and this was something that, we, that I'm sure wasn't picked up before, before this 3D uh, planning. Um, I think now, because we're, we're becoming more aware of it and other people are talking about it as well, we look at it differently and that's... Uh, Definitely one of the things that happened with, with the 3D, let's say the 3D imaging um, um, instead of the planning, but the planning has helped me a lot to, uh, to look at the pathology and see what's going on. Do you use this for distal radius malunions? Right? Not me, we have a, um, so in, in Antwerp, I work with uh, uh, Frederik Verstreke, who's one of our hand surgeons, and he's truly a pioneer in, um, in this 3D planning and 3D, uh, he made me enthusiastic about it as well, and he's done, I think nearly 300 now, distal radius uh, malunions with, uh, with this technique. And uh, he also used it for intra-articular uh, malunions, which is quite tricky. Um, but these, well, everyone's becoming better and better at, at, uh, at finding out tricks and talking about it. And he, he sort of travels, not at the moment not, but he sort of travels the world. He, he actually did a, uh, uh, this weekend, he did a presentation in, in uh, uh, virtual presentation in Leicester. So he uh, talks about this a lot. Great. Should we move on to our next talk then? Excellent. So uh, this is something that I, I actually I'm not a huge fan of this uh, of this pathology. Uh, osteochondritis dissecans is a uh, is a difficult one, um, mainly because obviously the pathology is, is can be quite nasty, but also because uh, this happens in uh, a very very let's say motivated uh, young people who. Uh, want to be in, in a gym 20 hours a week and doing tumbling and doing uh, somersaults and everything. And um, they are almost always overtrained and the parents are usually over uh, excited. Let's, uh, let's call them uh, excited. So uh, etiology, it's uh, uh, according to this uh, paper in, uh, in uh, American Academy Journal, 20% can recollect a single uh, traumatic event um, I think that's um, that's um, overstated. I, th- I think that probably, let's say, 99% have micro traumata, and uh, uh, almost all patients that I see, you know, very rarely as I don't see, very rarely I would see one who's not uh, extremely fanatical in the, in the sport that they do. It happens most often on the lateral side because the cartilage is weaker, and uh, obviously when you land on your hands. Uh, 60% of the force, which is which can be up to three times or more uh, body weight, even though they, these kids are not heavy, but but uh, you know multiply by three, and that's quite a bit of quite a bit of force on the lateral elbow. And uh, if you do that over and over and over and over again, something might go wrong. It can happen in the trochlea, but that's a little bit me- less common um, when a bit fast, but it, it does happen in the trochlea. Imaging radiographs usually patients come to me. Uh, with radiographs already, radiographs can be negative. It do, don't have to be positive. And actually, uh, you know, the more you see on a normal on a plain radiograph, probably the worse it is for the patient. Ultrasound um, not very useful to me, but you can um, you can see if there's any uh, increased fluid in the joint, maybe or uh, any other pathology. Of course, I have never done a bone scan in a in a um, you know non-adult. Uh, CT scans we do regularly, but prefer to uh, to do MRIs because uh, it it uh, obviously has less radiation and you can see the cartilage much better. So radiograph CT scan, uh, 3D CT scans, arthro CT, MRI uh, again, and arthro MRI if necessary. 
This is the most common um, classification, the ICRS stages of OCD. Uh, you get uh, in the first stage, you get compression of the subchondral bone, uh, partial loosening of the fragment in the second, complete loosening of the, of the fragment, but not displaced. So you get a, like a loose body inside you. And then uh, grade four, uh, you get an actual loose body. So grade one uh, or stage one, intact cartilage. Uh, treatment is very easy, but very difficult to explain to the parents. Stop loading it, stop the sports. So really nothing. I tell them to stop, stop completely and reevaluate in three months, not in six weeks. Nothing's gonna happen in six weeks, not in a month. And uh, uh, the parents will try to negotiate with you three months. If a three months not healed, another three months and another three months and another three months. And that becomes increasingly difficult to explain to the parents. And, and uh, I've had patients that, uh, well, let's say left me uh, to find a, a better, uh, better opinion. And then uh, unfortunately, um, I, I, I recollect quite a few who then come back with a loose body and, uh, and you know, an elbow that could have been saved is now, uh, is now uh, damaged. Healing depends on the age of the patient. As you know, uh, before the age of 12, it's probably Panos disease, which is diff different to, uh, to an OCD. OCD is very local um, and involves the cartilage, whereas Panos disease uh, involves the apophysial uh, um, bone and it will heal by itself. It, I, uh, I don't think that anyone has ever operated on a Panos disease, whereas on a um, OCD, that's a relatively common. So the ossification will occur from lateral to medial if you follow it on CT or, or, or radiographs, and it will happen in 70% if the physis is still open. So 70% of these patients, despite the fact they have OCD, they will still have a completely normal elbow if they stop loading it. If they keep on loading it, they'll, they'll break that little osteochondral fragment off and, uh, and the, the elbow will be damaged forever. If the physis is closed, uh, unfortunately, the chances are only 10%, so maybe we can be a little bit more aggressive with surgery in, uh, in you know, the older the patient is. This is the patient I showed you before, and this patient was very lucky after three months, it had simply healed. So the, the fragment had not come loose. Um, the cartilage uh, fissure that was there uh, didn't really bother, uh, didn't really bother the patient and subchondral bone or subchondral bony edema had uh, disappeared and the bone had healed. Slightly different with the loose fragment in situ, or with an actual loose body, I tend to get a CT scan uh, for these because um, um, unfortunately I tend to miss loose bodies quite easily on the MRI. Sometimes you, you, you don't even see it on an MRI, whereas on a CT scan, it can be quite obvious. And it will show you, like in this case, there is already a sclerotic uh, bone behind the lesion. So this lesion will probably not heal by itself anymore, despite the fact that it's still inside you. But with that sclerotic bone, uh, behind it, the body has stopped healing and, and this is it. The body's accepted that there's uh, something wrong and has uh, almost sequestered that little OCD. Um, surgery, you can fix the fragment, you can remove the fragment, you can uh, uh, transplant uh, cartilage and bone from, uh, from somewhere else, from the knee and oats, from the, from the ribs, uh, for example. You can do bone advancement and strengthen that uh, piece of subchondral bone as well. This, uh, this little girl had, uh, she actually has great parents. Uh, parents are very down to earth. It was a little girl that was very fanatic and wanted to go and go and go. And um, so she had this OCD lesion uh, still inside you. Uh, this is the middle gutter. I fastened it a little bit because uh, my talk was a little bit too, uh, too long this morning. And now uh, um, I figured out it was not too long anymore, but it's a little bit faster than I would normally do it. So this is an, there's an intact cartilage gap. So in this case, I would not think about removing that, uh, removing that fragment. So we, we basically drill into the lesion in the hope of uh, uh, generating some, uh, uh, some healing. Um, this was a little pin next to the lesion, get a suture retriever in. Um, we use a PDS suture because it's uh, absorbable. It'll take a long time before it actually absorbs. Uh, it was, uh, this was actually drilled from the uh, uh, Alacron fossa. And now this one we drill into the acron fossa. I don't tend to use fluoroscopy that much, but uh, um, it helps a little bit with, uh, with your direction. So go in, basically grab that PDS suture again from this side and then uh, uh, both ends of the PDS sutures and suture 
ended up in the fossa again. So just the back of the elbow has the electron fossa. Here are both our suture ends. I make sure there's no soft tissue in between. And then we go back into the radial gutter and uh, check our fixation. <clears throat> so reasonably simple uh, procedure, not the best fixation obviously, but we're counting on this little girl to heal, uh, to heal the fragment itself, itself. As you can see, this is an older patient, so uh, not as young as the little girl uh, just now. Uh, again, a uh, fragment inside you. Very little, um, very little synovitis, and not a lot of, uh, not a lot of reaction to that, uh, to that little fragment, but but painful and uh, sometimes blocking. Always check the medial gutter when you do this, because in the medial gutter, I think this patient was 14, 15 years old. Um, when you uh, lose bodies, tend to hide in the medial gutter, so uh, make sure that you go there, look inside, milk it uh, by pushing on the, uh, by pushing on the ulnar nerve, basically and then um, see if there's no loose bodies. And as you can see, we went from the medial gutter all the way to the radial gutter, and then that loose body had uh, actually come loose in between the CT scan and the surgery, as you can see. So we simply remove it, and then uh, this is a little bit controversial, so remove it, and um, I tend to, if I can, just shave the bottom of the, uh, the base of that, uh, of that lesion. So I shave it, and as you can see, I go through, um, uh, all the way through where I have, uh, uh, a nice uh, subchondral bone, and uh, this will start bleeding immediately. And I don't tend to always do uh, ice picking. In fact, I, I, I rarely do ice picking unless we have a lesion like I showed you before with a uh, with sclerotic bone behind it. So this is the front of the elbow, big loose body, and there you see a second uh, loose body inside you. That's there, it's not doing anything. So this is uh, waiting to be removed, I think. Definitely the loose body. So we remove this quite easily, that's simple. Then we go to the back again, check if there's no extra pieces of bone or cartilage floating around in the, on the medial side. There's the uh, olecranon fossa. And then from the olecranon fossa, we go to the radial gutter. Little loose body there. This is great for the resident or the fellow because uh, these, uh, these little ones are very, uh, uh, agile, they move around quite a bit and um, um, gives you great exercise to, to try and catch these. This is what we saw from the back, uh, from the front, I'm sorry. So that was just a piece of uh, uh, cartilage uh, with, with without a little bit of bone that's just waiting to be removed there. You can actually buy, be quite generous with your uh, removal as long as the lateral uh, column is intact. So if the lateral part of your capitellum is still okay, the radial head will be will uh, stay centered. If the lateral column is uh, is uh, is pathological and it needs to be removed, those are patients that will end up maybe with an eccentric loading on the radial head and uh, and big problems later on. So you can ice pick. As you can see, this this one is a little bit more uh, more sclerotic, so I couldn't get through with my uh, with my shaver, and then we just use an ice pick. But basically, what to yeah. And these surgeons told us. It's actually the same size and sometimes it looks huge in, uh, in these little elbows. Just making sure that we got through to, uh, to bleeding bone. And this is a nice bleeding surface here. And then that, that was, this was a complete surprise. So uh, with using suction, we had a tiny, tiny a loose body again, which uh, I probably would have missed, honestly, if it didn't uh, just present itself into my uh, into my shaver. So make sure the edges are uh, are stable. And as you can see here, the radial head is still centered and will still have quite a bit of support on the lateral side and on the medial side of this uh, of this big lesion. Osteochondral uh, autograft transplant, usually from the knee. A lot in the in the Asian literature, so a lot in, in Japan. Um, um, I think they they do much more than we do, much more uh, aggressive with this technique as well. Um, I tend to basically tell patients if it's that bad, I tell them to stop doing their sports. Um, I doubt that uh, doing a, um, honestly doubt that if you do an osteochondral transplant, um, that this patient will be a professional athlete with an elbow like this and with an injury like this and with surgery like this. And I know from the from Japanese literature, for example, they they go back to uh, to pitching. It's mainly baseball in in Japan, 
they go back to pitching, but I would certainly recommend against it. I, I'm, I've, I have children of my own, and I think many of you will have as well. And I always try to uh, treat my my little patients the same as I would treat my own my own uh, family. And um, in this case, I would tell my my boys, listen, boys, you have, you have an injury. Uh, it will not be you will not become a professional pitcher or a professional gymnast. It's probably time to uh, find something else. And um, I actually have a, a patient, a little girl. She uh, she was crying in my, in the rooms when I was telling her. And um, um, again, excellent parents. Parents also told her, "Listen, uh, it's it's uh, it's done. You can still go back to your, maybe your sports, but you never you're never going to be the best." And she became a swimmer, and she's now uh, she's now on the Olympic team. And she was only you know 10 years old, 11 years old when when I saw her. So that it was in the if it's in the girl or in the in the patient, you know that that motivation. They'll find something else that they're good at. But um, I'll I tell them not to load the elbow anymore. So Professor Kozo Shimada, uh, Shimada is one of the pioneers. He, uh, this is a, a chondral graft. He also has a technique where he uh, uh, gets some bone from the back of the elbow and uh, uh, transplants that that bone to the front. Um, you know, it's a uh, scary if you've never done it, and uh, um, but it can work. This is a patient of mine uh, early on in my career. She was then uh, the 12th on the WTA, the World Tennis Association for Women, or the Women's Tennis Association. And uh, she was 12th in, in the world back then. As you can see, she had an OCD lesion when she was younger. Um, she was treated uh, conservatively, uh, but uh, developed a loose body. And unfortunately for her, when she was 21, that loose body got uh, dislodged somehow and, uh, and blocked her elbow. And this was... Um, this CT was taken six weeks before the French Open, and we discussed it, and it only blocked once, but it was very painful for her. So we discussed it, and I told her, listen, you have no choice, uh, no chance of making it to the, to the French Open if you, uh, if you have surgery now. So we decided not to do surgery, and then unfortunately, I was wrong. She uh, blocked it again two weeks before the French Open now, and then she was unable to move around, so we, we had no choice but to do surgery. And uh, we did it immediately then, and that was two weeks before, and basically what we did was just remove the loose body. She's 21, the OCD lesion is no longer active. There's no reason to, uh, um, to take down that scar tissue or to do an ice picking or to do any, any kinds of transplant. So we just did a minor synovectomy, removed the loose body, and uh, this is her two weeks post-op when uh, uh, just the stitches we just removed and she made it to the fourth round, which is still, still the best uh, to date. Thank you. Great, awesome. There, there's one question, uh, Roger, is how do you diagnose an OCD clinically? Pain, pain with loading. And um, um, that's the only symptom. Um, if, if there is blocking or locking or catching, it's too late. So um, when they come and they say, I've had pain for, usually they've had pain for quite a few months because these little gymnasts are, are very tough. They're, uh, 12, 13 year old girls who are used to, uh, uh, used to training uh, 20 hours a week. They uh, usually their hands are callous, have more callus than mine. And uh, they're, they're tough little girls, so they don't complain very quickly. And uh, so when they come and say, listen, I, I, can't, I can't train as I used to, then take it seriously and get an MRI. I, I get an MRI in all of them. I don't even doubt it. When they come in, uh, I'm a little gymnast, or this is my little girl and she's a gymnast. And, um, She's had pain for a couple of months, get an MRI. Is, is there any role in any role of uh, redirectional osteotomy in, in, in the capitellum? I would say no, but, but that's, that's because I'm, I'm quite strict in telling them to stop doing their sports. It's not, it's really not nice. It's uh, they usually cry. Um, luckily I don't have to do it often, but every once in a while there is one. Um, and, uh, but I, I truly, truly believe that's better for the child. Great. Mr. Crompton has sent his apologies. He's still stuck in theater, so he won't be able to make it uh, this time. So we'll re um, kind of uh, put his talk in some other um, webinars in future. Uh, there's another question. Is there a role for surgery in Panner's disease or Hagman's disease? Panos disease, no. It's uh, Panos disease is, uh, is uh, self-limiting always, but you have to wait a little bit. The, the Panos disease are, are different as well. They're um, uh, generally boys, 
uh, a little bit uh, overweight, not the typical athlete. And uh, uh, Panos disease will always go away by itself. It's not a problem of the cartilage. Whereas in OCD, the problem lies in the cartilage and the joint itself, not uh, obviously the underlying bone, but uh, the problem is the cartilage. Whereas in Panos disease, it's the underlying bone, treat it as a bony edema and uh, it'll go away. Uh, trochlear AVN, uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, you get your fistil, fistil deformity if uh, you're on these patients and I'm not complete. I'm, I'm not sure if there's something we can do to, uh, to avoid it or to make it better. So we're treating the mechanical symptoms if they are, if they have mechanical symptoms. And otherwise you just wait and wait and wait. And uh, that's, a, that's a really difficult one. Great. Is there anything um, anyone has to discuss or ask Professor Van Reed? <clears throat> Fantastic. I think that was a great um, uh, two talks in one, Roger. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, I think the um, one of the things that we know um, from, a, generally speaking, from kids orthopedics is that they are actually relatively underserved um, um, in UK. Um, and with the OS team, um, we have, you know, as you know, pediatric, specialist pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Uh, like Tom Crompton, um, but in addition, what we have is, is the the highly specialist guys like yourself and Rags that look at you know different aspects of the joints. Um, so I'm quite excited that uh, as a group that we'll be able to uh, do this um, at the Cromwell. Um, you know, West, we already are doing it, but to further develop that service. Maybe I can add to that a little bit. I had the discussion today with uh, with one of our we have a Portuguese Portuguese visitor at the moment, and uh, um, uh, we're talking about this how in many many hospitals and many countries, also in Belgium and I'm sure in the UK, um, there's a supracondylar fracture, and uh, first of all the the, uh, the surgeon on call is uh, already trembling by by just the mere thought of having a supracondylar fracture, and feels uh, feels uh, uh, that he needs to that he or she needs to fix it straight away. That's not true. Put it in a plaster, uh, let it wait till the day after until uh, until your elbow, in this case your elbow guy, uh, hand and elbow, or shoulder and elbow, or elbow guy can do it, or uh, or elbow woman, and uh, and do it then. Unless of course there's a neurovascular injury. If there's a neurovascular injury, maybe you can you can still get away with the waiting when there's uh, just a, an anti anterior interosseous nerve. But you would prefer to do the reduction uh, uh, sooner, I think, if there's a neurovascular injury. Uh, definitely vascular injury, of course. But otherwise, if, if it's simply pain, put them in plaster. The patient will be much less painful. Follow them up because there will be some swelling. Make sure that the plaster is never, at no, at no point during the night that the plaster is too tight. Um, and do it uh, the day after with an experienced person and an experienced team uh, as, the first, as the first case of the day. And uh, um, the results will be much better. And uh, I think you're... Uh, your on-call surgeon will be much happier as well that he, that he or she doesn't need to do that. Uh, I think you're right. And lots of places here, uh, there has been a national audit um, and they have come to the conclusion that unless until there is a neurovascular vascular deficit, they can wait for the night and be done next day by somebody who is specialist in, in these injuries. Right. And again, um, in, a, in a chronic situation, the rotational deformities, they are really difficult. And we need specialist people who, who deal in that and who do lots of these so that their experience matters. Yeah, especially in these children, because I've, I've had, uh, my, myself, I've had, I've had kids coming to me four weeks, five weeks, six weeks after the trauma when it's more or less healed. And then you, know, you, you sort of see what went wrong. But at that point, you know, doing a surgery at that point is, is very difficult to explain to the parents and, uh, and very difficult to do as well because uh, it's already healed and then they usually have a ton of callus. You don't really know where it needs to be. And um, so then you have no choice but to wait. And then if it goes, if it you know continues to go wrong, like in the case I showed you, you have quite a difficult and quite, uh, quite big surgery. So you only have one chance. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's need for a lot of education among the orthopedic fraternity. And um, in fact, everyone who deal with the kids trauma. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Well, guys, thank you again for your time um, um, and um, look forward to seeing you um, again in a couple of weeks time for the next webinar.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now.